Kanding. In the shadow of the Himalayas, it's a hidden gateway to the Tibetan world. With a population of 100,000, Kanding is the largest city in Sichuan's wild western province. The Chinese government has worked hard to modernize the entire city. To the east is Han China. To the west, Tibet, with a bit of western influence thrown in. The Chinese have brought infrastructure, everything from bridges and roads to oversized TV screens. Like the mighty Zhedu River, born in the untamed Himalayas that cuts through Kanding, Tibetan culture holds strong. Patru was born in these mountains and raised his family here. He has agreed to take me high into the Himalayas to his childhood home. Our goal is not to reach the mountaintop, is to live with the Tibetan nomadic yak herders who still practice the old ways in the hidden valleys between these snow-capped peaks. Because we're still technically in Sichuan province, we can travel without special permits, even though, culturally, this is Tibet. We follow the river. The further from civilization, the wilder it gets. It's high summer, and the alpine meadows are in full bloom. But these mountains are not to be trifled with. The weather can go bad in minutes, and the temperature dropped 20 degrees. Luckily, Patru knows every tree and outcrop. He doesn't miss a chance to greet old friends and chase down local gossip. At last, we reach the valley home of Tering Mo and her husband, Gu Truje, where they graze their yaks during the summer months. They've been waiting for us and the fresh produce we brought with us from Kanding. It's difficult to cultivate anything at this altitude. Maybe this is where French fries really came from. Fresh corn is such a treat that even the patient setting can barely wait to eat. After this, it's back to traditional Tibetan fare, like gunja, Tibetan bread, made with tea, butter, barley flour, and sugar, and kneaded to just the right consistency. The Tibetans prefer to eat it raw, but it can be cooked like pita bread on the stovetop. Their tents lie in the shadow of the mighty mountain range of Gonga Shan. It's August, the warmest month of the year, though the river is still icy cold. Herding yaks is men's work. The best grazing is across the river. The yaks need to build up a layer of fat if they're to survive the coming winter. Though if you're going to convince them to wade across that cold water, you'd better have a good throwing arm. In case you think they have an easy job, yaks have a tendency to wander. That's 14,000 feet. And someone has to go get them at day's end. A rogue yak is a more serious issue. Chasing it away is an hour-long battle, best left to the youngsters. A typical Tibetan family will have some sheep and horses, 
but yaks are the real measure of their wealth. Back at the tents, Setting has been working nonstop since dawn. Her 12-year-old son is in town, getting an education. Setting takes pride in her nomadic culture, but she wants her child to make his own decisions. Traditional life may seem romantic, but it's not easy. Beds are made of bundled sticks with, if you're lucky, a felted blanket on top. The stove burns both wood and dried yak dung. There's no toilet and no shower, just an ice cold stream that doubles as their water supply. Most Tibetans own enormous, vicious, mastiff dogs, bred to scare off predators. He may not look the part, but don't be fooled. He's ready to take on anything. And win. Early one morning, I finally realize why they're so happy here. Tsering is waiting, but her smile isn't for me. It's for her yaks. And they love her as much as she loves them. They come when called, running down the valley. She rewards each one with a handful of salt and grain. Around her, these half-wild, sharp-horned beasts morph into docile pets, allowing her to separate even their youngest calves. Utruje stands back. The yaks are not as fond of him. Setting makes sure mine is safely hobbled. Even after I try to remove my foreign smell, this yak is still not happy that it's me. The Tibetan nomads are profoundly connected to both their animals and the land that their ancestors have inhabited for over a thousand years. An hour later, the milking's done, but Tsering's work has only just begun. Today, they're going to make yak butter and cheese. Setting is one of the most beautiful women I've ever met. It's not just her high cheekbones and smooth skin. She radiates a sense of peace and makes everyone feel like family. Her yaks provide her family with almost everything they need their homes, fuel to cook and stay warm, the cash they need to buy medicines, and most importantly, butter and cheese. Female yaks, technically called knacks, only produce as much milk as a goat, so not a single drop gets wasted. The milk is heated to 145 degrees. Once upon a time, they used the stomach of a goat. Nowadays, they have a newfangled churning machine. Most nomads drink 20 to 60 cups of yak butter tea per day. 
the fat provides much needed calories against the cold. But most importantly, it functions as their currency. This is their bank account. Fresh yak butter can last up to a year. The leftover buttermilk is used to make cheese. She adds more milk, heats it, and allows the mixture to curdle. It's very hot. She kneads it like dough until it has the consistency of mozzarella cheese. Tibetans are among the few Asian cultures who subsist on dairy products. Cheese and butter can only be made during the calving season and has to last them through the long winter months. Tsering Mo and her family know how to survive up here year round, as their ancestors have done since ancient times. But I can't help wonder, how will they maintain their nomadic way of life when the world is modernizing all around them? When we get back to Kanding, something is going on. A crowd has gathered in the town square to dance. You can't even tell who's in charge. They all seem to be following each other. It's mostly older women, with a sprinkling of youngsters thrown in. This is a Tibetan custom, eagerly adopted by the local Han Chinese and no one seems to care if they know all the moves. The men are mostly standing on the sidelines, though a few are braver than the rest. As darkness falls, everyone begins to blur together. An ancient Tibetan dance in a modern Chinese square. I think these women are onto something. It won't solve all their problems, but it's not a bad place to start.